Hi, I'm Makiza Latifa. Welcome to the show. I hope your week has been amazing and you are excited about this edition of the show like I am. Now, the past week has been characterized by a lot of trending news, especially about the situation of oppression currently suffered by the Palestinian people in the midst of the genocidal offensive launched by Israel against the Gaza Strip. Now, on the back of this, Chinese Special Envoy Zhai Jun has indicated that to end the cycle of conflicts between Palestine and Israel, there must be a resumption of peace talks aimed at establishing an independent state of Palestine that was revealed in a phone conversation with Amal Jadu, the first Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Palestine. There are more insights into this story and many others on this episode of China Currents with Chris, so stay tuned. China Currents is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting-edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. The biggest news from last week was undoubtedly Gaza. Regarding the latest conflict, on October 12th, Chinese Special Envoy Zhai Jun engaged in a phone conversation with Mao Jadu, the first Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Palestine, noted that the priority is to cease fire immediately and protect civilians. The Chinese Special Envoy said that to end the cycle of conflict between Palestine and Israel, there must be a return to the two-state solution and resumption of peace talks aimed at establishing an independent state of Palestine to achieve peaceful coexistence of Palestine and Israel. Jadu expressed gratitude for China's long-standing and fair stance on the Palestinian issue, as well as its active efforts in promoting peace negotiations. He expressed confidence in China's continued constructive role in the current situation. In a separate development, the Pentagon made an announcement regarding the deployment of aircraft carrier USS Gerard R. Ford to a hostile region in the Mediterranean on Saturday. The U.S. Army General Eric Carrillo emphasized that this deployment sends a robust signal of deterrence, showcasing the military's commitment to maintaining stability and security in the region. China's firm support to the Palestinian cause can be dated back to the Mao era. In the 1960s and 70s, the Chinese government openly supported the Palestinian cause as a fellow liberation movement. China did not have diplomatic relations with Israel until 1992. And after that, China remains its alignment with the Arab countries and advocates for a two-state solution based on 1967 boundaries as a solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And on October 13, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi said in a press conference that the root of this problem lies in the long delay in the realization of Palestine's aspiration to establish an independent state and in the fact that the historical injustice suffered by the Palestinian people has not been corrected. Next up, diplomacy. On October 7th, the U.S. Senate Majority Leader, Democrat Chuck Schumer, along with Republican Senator Mike Crapo, led a bipartisan delegation of senators to Shanghai, kicking off their visit to China. This marked the first visit by a U.S. congressional delegation to China in four years. Schumer emphasized that the U.S. places great importance on sino American relations and is not seeking decoupling or a conflict with China. The purpose of this visit is to engage in a candid, in-depth, constructive, and fruitful dialogue to enhance mutual understanding and ensure that the development of U.S.-China relations benefits both countries and the world. Schumer is known for his hawkish stance towards China, often urging the U.S. government to adopt a tougher position. He has long focused on Sino-American trade and financial issues and has repeatedly criticized China for the so-called currency manipulation earning him the reputation of being a flag bearer for the currency-related bills. He has also supported the Trump administration's decision to initiate a trade war with China. Key members of the U.S. Congress hold significant influence on matters related to China, and their fundamental understanding reflects the mainstream sentiment in the Congress regarding China-related issues. This visit to China will assist them in gaining a more balanced understanding of China's situation and its position on various issues. Next up, on technology, 
On October 11th, China unveiled a breakthrough in quantum computing with development of Zhujiang 3.0, a quantum computing prototype capable of detecting and manipulating 255 photons. It pushed the boundaries of quantum information processing and broke previous world records. Led by renowned Chinese quantum physicist Pan Jianwei, the research team has successfully pushed the boundaries of photon manipulation and quantum computing complexity. According to published information, the most complex sample processed by Zhujiang 3.0 in just one millionth of a second would take the world's most powerful supercomputer frontier more than 20 billion years to complete. Quantum computing is a new paradigm in computing. It holds the potential for exponentially accelerated processing power compared to classical computers for specific problems of significant societal and economic value. As a result, the development of quantum computers is one of the most important challenges on the global technological frontier today. This achievement positions China at the forefront of global quantum information research and reinforces its commitment to pushing the boundaries of scientific innovation. Next up, on October 10th, China's State Council Information Office released a white paper titled The Belt and Road Initiative, a key pillar of the global community of shared future. The white paper emphasizes that the Belt and Road Initiative has become the most comprehensive and largest international cooperation platform, focusing on connectivity, infrastructure development, policy coordination, trade facilitation, financial integration, and people-to-people -people exchanges. The white paper stresses that the participating countries should make use of their respective advantages, continuously expand cooperation areas, innovate cooperation models, and make positive progress in building a healthy, green, innovative, and digital silk road. This will further expand the space for international cooperation. It provides a comprehensive overview of the goals, principles, and achievements of the initiative while highlighting the immense potential for international cooperation and common development. This white paper was released ahead of the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, which is to be held in Beijing on October 17th and 18th. The conference will mark the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative with representatives from many developing countries, notably from Latin America and Africa, expected to attend. And next up, on October 11th, Chen Lei, an Australian spy who has been detained in China on national security charges for more than three years, returned to Melbourne after being released. Born in China's Hunan province, Chen Lei was a business television anchor for China's national television. However, in August 2020, the Beijing Municipal State Security Bureau found Chen Lei had provided classified economic secrets to Australian and US entities. After a public trial held by the Beijing Second Intermediate People's Court, Chen Lei truthfully confessed to the criminal facts, voluntarily pleaded guilty. He had been deported after serving her sentences of two years and 11 months. The case should not be directly linked to the improvement of China-Australia relations as the matter is not a transactional deal for mending ties. An improvement of bilateral relations should not be based on individual events said by Chen Hong, the director of the Australian Studies Centre at East China Normal University. Next up, let's turn to Chinese economy. On October 9th, the South Korean presidential office announced that the United States had agreed to allow Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix to supply equipment to their factories in China without additional permissions. This means that Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix can supply semiconductor equipment containing American technology to their Chinese factories without separate U.S. approval. In a statement, Samsung said, through close coordination with relevant governments, the uncertainties related to the operation of our semiconductor manufacturing line in China have been significantly removed. Looking back, in October 2022, the Biden administration implemented comprehensive export control measures prohibiting U.S. companies from exporting equipment needed to produce chips in China chip manufacturers. It stipulated that Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix needed to obtain licenses to bring American chip-making equipment into China. As the world's largest and second largest memory chip manufacturers, Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix have been deeply cultivated in the Chinese market for many years. As of the end of June 2023, these two South Korean companies control nearly 70% of the global dynamic semiconductor memory and 50% of the flash memory chip market. 
And Chinese netizens believe that the reason for this relaxation of US sanctions is that China has made significant breakthrough in the ability to manufacture chips independently. They argue that the export ban, besides causing economic damages to South Korea, serves no other purpose. Next up, on October 10th, a Philippine Navy gunboat, despite repeated dissuasion and warning from China, insisted on intruding into the waters near China's Huangyan Island. When repeated loudspeaker warnings were ineffective, the Chinese Coast Guard ship legally took necessary measures such as tracking and driving out and road control against the Philippine ship. The officials said that China has indisputable sovereignty over Huangyan Island and its adjacent waters, therefore holds sovereign rights and jurisdiction over the related waters. The action of the Philippines infringe upon China's sovereignty seriously violates international law and basic norms of international relations. The China Coast Guard will continue to carry out law enforcement activities to protect rights in China's jurisdictional water according to the law and resolutely safeguarding national sovereignty and maritime rights and interests. Chinese netizens argue that China's territorial security is inviolable and they praise the government's expulsion action. Last but not least, let's take a look at China's efforts in combating corruption. On October 10th, the Discipline Inspection Authority of Shenzhen City revealed the finding of an investigation. A retired transport bureau official was found gaining illegal profit during his tenure decades ago. All illicit income has been seized. The news, which may appear unremarkable, quickly spread across Chinese social media, with many netizens expressing their approval of this investigation. The trend traces back seven months when a Chinese netizen residing in Australia flaunted her opulent lifestyle on social media. Boasting about her family's billions of savings, she credited lower-class Chinese taxpayers for their wealth. She later posted photos of her retired government official grandfather who worked in Shenzhen. In almost joking tone, she wrote, Guess he's corrupted. These provocative actions stirred public outrage and fueled demands for a government investigation. Shenzhen is known as one of the first special economic zones in China after its opening up in the 1980s. Many believe that the retired official had accepted bribes and profited from abundant foreign investment in those days, especially considering his granddaughter's wealth and migration to Australia. Yet the authorities' initial hesitation in releasing their investigation led to further suspicion. As a result, the username of the granddaughter's social media account, Beijing Nianyu, becomes a term referring to the spoiled kids of government officials who can just insult ordinary people and walk away. Now, as the inspection authority's conclusion was published, the public applauded the penalties imposed on this former official, though many still wait for further detail of this case to be revealed. As for the granddaughter's provocative actions online, people remarked that she was digging her own grave and now she will face what she deserves. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts and comments about our show, please reach us at email address below. I'm Chris, looking forward to hearing from you and see you next time. Well, thanks for the updates, Chris. Next up is Threshold with Lisa where we bring you cutting-edge technological innovations happening in China. Now, reports indicate that China is set to launch the next mission in its moon program come 2024. The objective is to land on the far side of the moon and collect samples from the giant Aitken Basin impact crater. And also, Chinese scientists have developed a groundbreaking AI chip inspired by the brain. Lisa has updates on these and other mind-blowing technology and science-related stories in today's Threshold. Keep watching. Hi, I'm Lisa and this is Threshold in China. Today we are going to share some exciting tech innovations and announcements that happened in China last week. Chinese scientists have developed the world's first fully system integrated memristor chip, unlocking the potential to enhance artificial intelligence, self driving cars, and enable more human like learning in AI systems. As artificial intelligence grows more advanced, it becomes difficult for computers to process massive amounts of data efficiently because data serves as the vital information that computers utilize to carry out their tasks, encompassing numbers, words, images, and sounds. 
This data is dispersed across various locations, both within and outside the computer, such as disk, memory, and cloud servers. Whenever the computer needs to access specific data, it must transfer it from one location to another, resulting in time consumption and energy expenditure. To address this, Chinese scientists have developed a new computer chip that mimics the energy-efficient approach of the human brain. It is estimated that a human brain uses roughly 20 watts to work. That is equivalent to the energy consumption of your computer monitor in sleep mode. So scientists looked to human brain for inspirations and came up with the idea of computing in memory. Computing in memory, CIM, refers to a computing paradigm where data processing and storage are tightly integrated within the same memory unit. As we've mentioned, in traditional computing architectures, data is stored in separate memory units like RAM or disk storage and processed in separate computation units like CPUs. However, in CIM, the memory units themselves can perform computations, so data does not need to move between the memory and the processing units. This brings unique advantages to computing in memory, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. Current AI technologies require moving large amounts of data between computing and memory units, which hinders on-device learning. This challenge is amplified by the rise of large language models, LLMs. LLMs demand significant computational power, with training using over energy that's roughly equivalent to that of a thousand household in a year, and having a comparable carbon footprint to five average cars. Larger and deeper models are usually more accurate, but also more costly to train and run. So scientists from Beijing Tsinghua University turned to this idea of computing in memory with the innovative design of memory resistor. A memristor is a type of electrical current that can remember how much current has passed through it. It can change its resistance, which is how much it resists the flow of the current, depending on the previous current. This means that a memristor can store information without needing power, unlike other types of memory devices. Therefore, this technology enables real-time learning directly on computer chips, empowering rapid adaption to dynamic environments. Furthermore, researchers have developed Stellar, an algorithm and architecture that effectively integrates memory resistor into the chip. As a result, the team has successfully developed the world's first fully integrated memory resistor computing in memory chip that supports efficient on-chip learning. The chip has been tested and shown its capability in various learning tasks such as image classification, speech recognition, and control tasks. It has demonstrated high adaptability, energy efficiency, versatility, and accuracy. In fact, it consumes only 3% of the energy compared to dedicated integrated circuit system using advanced processes when performing the same task. This highlights the exceptional energy efficiency advantages. This technology has the potential to meet high computational power requirements of the AI era and provides a path to overcome the energy efficiency limitations of the traditional computer architecture. China's upcoming Chang'e 6 lunar mission is on track for launch next year. The goal is to land on the far side of the moon and collect samples from the giant Atkin Basin impact crater to further our understanding of the moon's history. The China National Space Administration says the Chuetiao 2 relay satellite is also scheduled to launch in early next year. This craft will enable vital communications between Earth and the Moon ladder. Chang'e 6 mission will carry payloads and satellites from four countries. They include a French-made instrument to detect the radioactive gas radon, a negative ion detector from the European Space Agency, an Italian laser corner reflector to calibrate radar systems, and Pakistan's CubeSat, a square-shaped miniature satellite. China has an ambitious roadmap for landing astronauts on the moon before 2030. Earlier unmanned mission will lay the groundwork. In 2024, Chang'e 6 will collect samples from the lunar's far side. Chang'e 7 in 2026 will scout resources in the South Pole region. By 2028, Chang'e 8 aims to establish a basic international lunar research station with extensive cooperation opportunities.
Notably, China plans to offer more space for foreign equipment on future Chang'e 8 moon mission. Specifically, it will have 200 kg of payload capacity for interested countries, which is unprecedented. This could include fixed instruments, rovers, robots, and more. CNSA also welcomed border mission level cooperation with separate probe interacting in orbit or joint surface exploration. It is exciting to see nations working together as humanity reaches further into the unknown. Once again, Chinese scientists have showcased their dedication in the field of quantum computing. A team of Chinese scientists from the Chinese Academy of Science have developed a cutting-edge quantum computing prototype, Zhou Zhang 3 with 255 photons. This achievement has not only set a new world record in the field of atomic quantum information technology, but also demonstrated the remarkable capabilities of quantum computing. The processing speed of Zhou Zhang 3 for Gaussian boson sampling has skyrocketed by an astonishing 1 million times compared to its previous iteration, Zhou Zhang 2. To put this tremendous leap into perspective, the highest complexity sample handled by Zhou Zhang 3 within a mere one millionth of a second would take the current fastest supercomputer frontier 20 billion years to complete. So what exactly is quantum computing and why is it such a big deal? To put it simply, conventional computers like the one we use on a daily basis process information using bits that represent either a null or a one. However, in the world of quantum computing, information is stored and processed using quantum bits or qubits. Unlike regular bits, qubits can exist in multiple states simultaneously thanks to a phenomenon called superposition. This unique characteristic allows quantum computers to handle vast amounts of data and perform complex calculations much more efficiently than classical computers. The Zhuzhong 3 prototype utilized the power of photons, which are particles of light, to carry out quantum computations. By manipulating these photons and their interactions, the scientists have achieved remarkable results. To better understand the significance of this breakthrough, let's imagine you have a large pile of puzzle pieces, and your task is to find the pieces that fit together to form a complete picture. Solving this puzzle using a classical computer would involve trying each combination one by one, which could take an extremely long time. However, quantum computer like Zhou Zhang 3 can explore multiple combinations simultaneously and can therefore significantly speed up the puzzle solving process. In addition, the Zhou Zhang 3 prototype also represents a significant advancement in the field of quantum information technology. The researchers have developed methods to detect and manipulate photons with high positions, enhancing the overall performance of the quantum computing system. Quantum computers have the potential to revolutionize industries such as cure, discovery, optimization problems, and cryptography, among others, by providing solutions that were previously unattainable due to the limitations of classical computers. A new study has found that a traditional Chinese herbal formula Da Dian Zhong decoction can improve cognitive function and prevent neural losses in a mouse model of aging. Da Dian Zhong decoction is a traditional Chinese medicine that has been used for centuries to treat various digestive disorders such as constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, nausea, and vomiting. Now, a modern research has also shown that Da Dian Zhong has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and a neuroprotective effect, and that, as we have mentioned, can improve cognitive function and prevent neural losses in aging mice. In this study from Chengdu University, researchers revealed Da Dian Zhong triggers mitophagy to achieve these benefits. Mitophagy is a quality control process that removes dysfunctional mitochondria. Mitochondria are our cells' power plants, fueling various cellular functions. However, they can churn out reactive oxygen species, ROS, leading to oxidative stress and cell damage. That's where mitophagy comes in. This quality control mechanism gets rid of dysfunctional mitochondria, helping to maintain a healthy balance in our cells. 
If mitophagies goes awry, it's been linked to aging and neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer and Parkinson's. In their study, researchers used a mouse model of aging to investigate the effect of da jian zhong on cognitive decline. They treated mice with da jian zhong for 35 days and assessed the cognitive performance using behavioral tests. The results show that da jian zhong improved learning, memory, and reduced anxiety-like behaviors. It also protected neurons in the hippocampus, a brain region crucial for memory. Da Jian Zhong activated the pink one Parkin mitochondria autophagy pathway and enhanced the mitochondrial function. The study concluded that Da Jian Zhong rejuvenates cognitive function by activating mitophagy. The research emphasized the need for future investigation to delve deeper into the intricate mechanism involved and determine the optimal dosage of Da Jian Zhong to enhance mitophagy. But we can see that Da Jian Zhong is a classic example of how ancient wisdom can be applied to modern health problems. And that is all for today's Threshold. We hope you like this new section on science and technology in China. As usual, we welcome your thoughts and feedback. Thanks, Lisa. Let's now turn our attention to the Thinkers Forum, one of my favorite segments of the show because it connects China to Africa and the rest of the world. Last week, we talked about China's Belt and Road Initiative on the show, and you got to understand what it meant through the lens of John Ross, a senior fellow at the Chinyang Institute for Financial Studies in China. This week, we continue that discussion, but this time around with primary focus on the 10th anniversary of the BRI, as presented by a professor of economics and banking, Professor Richard Werner. <music> My name is Professor Richard Werner. I'm Professor of Economics and Banking. And today I would like to talk about the 10th anniversary of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. This major initiative was launched in 2013 by Chinese President Xi Jinping. It was taken very seriously in China. It was even enshrined in the constitution of the Communist Party. But how important is it for the world? To understand that, we need to reflect a little bit on post-war economic development in the world and also the monetary and financial system in the world. And that started really um, with the Bretton Woods um, Agreement. So we have to go back um, actually first to 1942 because that's when the US and UK led anti-German and Japanese international military alliance of 26 countries known as the Allies rebranded themselves as the United Nations. The growing number of military allies, which mainly consisted of Imperial Britain and its many colonies, um, and the United States of America and its colonies, um, and the US leading this event, and it was at this conference in 1944 that plans for an international monetary system were finalized. It was decided that at the center of this international monetary system was going to be the US dollar. There was actually some debate because the UK wasn't entirely happy about this. Keynes represented the UK and was arguing against it. But the US won out and a system of fixed exchange rates against the US dollar was implemented while the dollar itself would be linked to gold and could be exchanged at a fixed price into gold. That system was to last for a quarter century until August 1971. What had happened was this is a, a major privilege and um, some actually criticized that America had this privilege and America actually did proceed to abuse the powers of this privilege by creating a lot of US dollars and then proceeding to use these US dollars to purchase land, property, companies, uh, all sorts of assets uh, from the countries that had joined the system. That wasn't really fair, it angered many people, but of course in many countries the leadership had no standing to complain because there were US troops in the country. Um, so Germany, Japan, 
were quiet, but France was not a member of NATO, uh, didn't really have uh, an American army contingency in, in the country, it spoke up. France complained and said, listen, you're just printing dollars and buying our assets, that is unfair. And they came up with a response. They said, well, according to the rules, all the dollars you're giving us, which you've just printed, we can exchange into gold. And France proceeded to do that. Gold reserves uh, started to decline. The Americans um, initially said, well, we're, of course you can do that. And the Federal Reserve Bank of New York will be holding your gold in custody for you. That wasn't quite enough for the French. So they sent large Navy ships to New York, to Manhattan, with the captain uh, of the ship being instructed to take his, his men to and, and go to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in Manhattan and physically take the gold out and bring it to France. Quite dramatic. Now, when that happened a few times, it was clear the US was not going to allow this continued depletion of gold reserves. And so a famous speech was given by President Nixon on the 15th of August, 1971, uh, in which he announced that the US would temporarily suspend the dollar convertibility into gold, which actually was a US default on its obligations to the members of the Bretton Woods system. And yeah, just remember when politicians say temporarily, still uh, the situation today, of course, there's no convertibility into gold. But this meant that gold, that the, the dollar fell. And that required a response because if the dollar was going to fall continuously, that would actually limit U.S. power in the world and military hegemony. And therefore, the U.S. devised ways to, to stop the fall of the dollar. Now, the problem was this. There were two countries, Japan and Germany at the time, that had very large trade surpluses against the world and particularly against America. And this meant that essentially the Germans and Japanese didn't find enough goods and services to buy in America. And so the Americans thought, what do these countries need? They're not buying enough from us. We have a trade deficit. And they realized, well, they need energy. They need oil. So Henry Kissinger was sent to Saudi Arabia and a deal was made. And this is the beginning of the petrodollar. So the gold dollar was dropped and the new system took um, you know, a couple of years to introduce was based on the petrodollar. The story was very simple. The deal was simple with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was the largest oil producer and exporter. And the agreement was made between, uh, initially actually a secret agreement between the US and Saudi Arabia, that Saudi Arabia would sell its oil only against the US dollar. And in exchange, uh, the US would protect the interests of the ruling family, the government there. It's a bit of a protection racket, isn't it? The Americans coming around and saying, oh, nice um, country you have, uh, very stable, you're earning lots of money. It would be a shame if something happened to it, like regime change. So we'll protect you. And uh, the Saudis agreed. Part of the secret deal was also that 80% of the dollar um, earnings, which then started to accumulate, uh, would be invested back in the U.S. and U.S. treasuries. And that solved the problem that the U.S. had huge expenditures um, also you know, off budget, black budgets uh, for the deep state and the global military expansion, uh, foreign wars. So this way, the dollars would be earned and would come back to the U.S. And that's how, um, of course, the dollar then was supported because Germany and Japan now needed to work hard to earn somehow dollars. They needed dollars. Um, and that underpinned the value um, of the dollar, but really to make this really work and also to extract resources to the maximum from Germany and Japan, which really this was about. It's a transfer of wealth from Germany and Japan to the US. The US leadership thought, well, it would be better even if the oil price went up a lot. 
And as we now know that a lot of the information has been declassified and has been uh, released, um, the so-called oil shock um, was actually instigated by the U.S. Henry Kissinger arm-twisted the reluctant Saudi Arabian oil minister to quadruple the oil price in January 74. Now, to hide that and also to shift the blame and also to, again, support the U.S. dollar, well, in 1972 and 71, the Federal Reserve had instructed the other central banks in the American sphere of influence, in the American empire, um, which is the Five Eyes countries and Europe uh, and, um, and, and Japan, um, to go out and print dollars. Because if the other central banks were printing lots of dollars, America and the US dollar wouldn't look so bad. So that was another way of stabilizing the dollar at the time while this arrangement with the petrodollar was going on. And it took a while for them to kick up the oil price in January 74. And so we know now that the inflation of the 70s was actually not due to the oil shock because it was, that was too late. The inflation was already there in 73. The oil price really quadrupled only in January 74. But the inflation was due to 18 months earlier, the central banks printing a whole lot of money, just like in, uh, in 2020, causing the inflation of 21, 22. Um, same story. And again, we're told it's a war um, and, a, and an energy shock embargo. That's the, the reason, just like in the 70s. They're just replaying this game when really it was... Um, something else. It was the monetary policies of, of the Fed. Um, and of course, the Americans weren't happy that Germany at the time in the 70s uh, was looking for alternative sources of energy, such as Russia, Soviet Union, which, you know, Soviet Union delivered uh, even during the Cold War quite um, safely. The U.S. wanted to stop that, and they've achieved that somehow. Somebody blew up Nord Stream to the Russian uh, oil pipeline to Germany. Well, but back to the developing countries in the Bretton Woods system. Because at the same time, in the 1950s and 60s, more and more countries received independence. And that does go back to the war. Um, during the Second World War, the official story was that the US and the UK were fighting for freedom and liberty. But actually, they were imperial powers. And the majority of the world's population was in colonies and didn't have um, independence, freedom, and democracy uh, in a meaningful sense. And therefore, from in the 50s and 60s, the pressure became stronger and there was struggle for independence uh, in many countries and many countries became independent. Now, that's when modern development economics was presented. They're giving advice that it's being dished out also very strongly from these Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. And um, they focused on um, the advice and in fact, it was essentially conditionality. IMF World Bank would give money only if you do what they say. And they were focusing on telling these countries to deregulate, liberalize, and privatize. This is known as the Washington Consensus of Development Economics because the Washington-based institutions, IMF World Bank, USAID, US Treasury, Inter-American Development Bank, um, they all pushed this, but also the OECD, the European Brussels-based bureaucracy, which is very much influenced and under U.S. influence, NATO is in Brussels as well. Um, and the advice is to deregulate, liberalize and privatize, open up developing countries to international money and foreign competition, then everything will be fine. Sadly, there is no country that has developed based on this. Uh, in fact, there's only really five countries or regions that have decisively moved from de developing country status to developed country status, and they're all in East Asia. And they include Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and China and its regions, including Taiwan. And all these successfully developing, developed countries that moved to developed country status, what they did is they ignored the IMF advice and did what was forbidden to developing countries to do. Um, namely, they adopted industrial policy um, and also they did not rely very much on foreign investment. So in the late 1980s, Japanese finance ministers pointed out to the IMF and World Bank leadership that their advice just deregulate, liberalize and privatize was not leading to success. 
And instead, the Washington institutions should look at how East Asian countries, including Japan, were so successful and had very high economic growth. But that was rebuffed. Um, and essentially, um, the advice didn't change. Next, China made very sincere attempts at formal improvements in the IMF and World Bank um, structure, shareholder meetings, trying to get other countries to have more influence uh, because the US were dominating these institutions, but um, that was also rebuffed. Um, as a result, the Chinese leadership devised a bold initiative, and that is the Belt and Road Initiative launched by Xi Jinping. So China established alternatives to the World Bank and IMF, the New Development Bank, and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Banks in Shanghai and in Beijing, and also the Shanghai Corporation Organization and the BRICS group of, of countries, which has just recently been doubled in size, uh, also to include many oil uh, producers. So very interesting now, the developments just uh, in these, these days as we're talking. Um, and importantly, China, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, does not impose its rules on the countries it's helping. Instead, it's investing its foreign exchange reserves in uh, building infrastructure for these countries and helping them develop and trade together and together have prosperity without what the IMF and World Bank have been doing, very much interfering, dictating, even changes to the constitution. So many developing countries are really happy about the Chinese approach um, and it's been quite successful. What we next need is for China to champion the establishment of many small local banks in developing countries, just as Deng Xiaoping did in China at home, to launch the rapid rise of the Chinese economy. Because this will be the alternative, the ultimate alternative to the Washington-based wrong-headed development economics, which really considers banks as unimportant and says borrow from foreigners, but that creates debt and dependence. And that's how these developing countries have uh, really been subjugated to colonial exploitation, being forced to sell their raw material very cheaply, their currencies are depreciating, their foreign debt is going up. No, actually, they need to establish many small local banks, create their own credit and money and have high growth development. That system is really what developing countries also need to do together with the Belt and Road Initiative. Then um, economic success will be even more impressive and a strong middle class will be created, inequality declines and prosperity will be accelerated. So the Belt and Road Initiative which is connected to the BRICS initiative um, and complements it. There's now the prospect of a new alternative international monetary system, not based on the US dollar, that facilitates peaceful trade and cooperation and does not require oil and energy wars, as is the case with the alien petrodollar. So it's a good moment uh, with... Uh, you know, a decade of the Belt and Road Initiative to celebrate these strengths and, um, and further encourage everyone to engage with China and this initiative. Thank you. Well, here's where we draw the curtains on today's edition of the show. I'm super grateful for your time as always, and I hope you enjoyed every bit of today's show. From China Currents to Threshold and the Thinkers Forum, please do not hesitate to share with me your comments, thoughts, feedback, and suggestions for the coming episodes of the show through the email provided below. My name is Marquisa Micheline Latifa, and I'll see you same time next week. <laughs>